All right, so today we're going to talk about a differential expression, but a slightly more advanced topic. We're going to cover empirical Bayes um, as a, a statistical method that we can use to improve some of the methods for differential expression. All right, so we, we talked about this in our previous differential expression lecture. These are the statistics that we calculate to form the t-test. We have a sample uh, for each gene, we have we have uh, a measurement from several replicates from first condition and several measurements from the second condition. We compute the averages for each condition, y bar and x bar, and then we compute the variances or standard deviations for each um, populate for each with for the variance within each population. Here we're computing the variance out of the standard deviation square for population 1 and population 2. Then we use that to form the t-statistic, which is a <coughs> standard for, for finding differences between two groups. Now, in gene expression studies and other studies as well that have that, 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 the high, high throughput data, we're going to be able to do this. Um, when we have a, when the number of, of replicates is small, the t-test is actually not a very good uh, approach. It's not very powerful. And today we're going to explain the one of the more popular approaches implemented by the Bioconductor Lima package, L-I-M-M-A. And we are going to explain what the, the, the statistical ideas behind what that does to improve the power of the test we use. So we uh, saw these pictures before. This is for a 3 versus 3 experiment and three, three replicas from each condition. And here we're using def the default pre-processing in differential expression, which, as we explained in the pre-processing lecture, has more noise than we want we would want to see. Nevertheless, th these, these are the results we get. And this here is the difference between the averages. So this would be y bar minus x bar. And here we're plotting that same value in the y-axis, but on the on the x-axis, but on the y-axis we're plotting we're actually computing a p-value using a t-test, and we're showing um, we're showing the log base 10 p-value, negative log base 10 p-value. So we talked about how the, the using the t-test makes us realize that this this gene that had a big average difference was that average difference was probably due to chance. So we we have a small p-value. We have, but we also have a case where the 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 t test was very large because the denominator was small, not because the uh, effect size was was that big, and that 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 might also be a problem. So here's a close up of those genes, those three genes I just showed. You the this is the one that has a large difference, large denominator, but also a large, sorry, a large numerator, but also a large denominator because the the across the within group variance is large. Here's a, a third gene where the within group variance is small, so the denominator is small. The numerator is also small, but not small enough. So the uh, denominator being small makes the t-test big. And then here's the second one, which is the, the one that actually looks the best. So, um, th so today we're talking about a problem that relates to the, the denominator. Uh, we're trying to improve how we estimate the denominator. So, uh, now we're going to show a series of plots based on a uh, the spiking experiment we described before, where we know some some um, we know 16 genes that are differentially expressed, and we know that the others should not be because these are replicate samples. So here's an MA plot using default preprocessing, and we see it's it's quite noisy. There's a lot of genes that have <coughs> very large effect sizes and also very large p-values, but um, they're all false positive. These are all false positives, and they're they're almost un indistinguishable from the real uh, genes, from the genes that are actually differentially expressed. Now, using alternative pre-processing algorithms does improve things. You see, we have a lot of the noisy. Uh, a lot of the genes that were out here are now gone. It's because we've reduced a lot of the variance from the pre-processing side. That was technical variance, not biological variance. And we can see that the 
the genes that are dif that are actually known to be differentially expressed kind of pop out a little bit. Now, this p-value is based on the t-test. So, one the, a new problem that arises now, although it was present before, but the, the, the problem that stands out now are these genes. These are these would be false positives too if we go by the p-value. See, all these genes have tiny p-values, yet they're false positives. We, we and a hint that they're false positives is that their effect sizes are not large, right? So they're, they're close to zero. Same, same, same with these guys here. So that is that has to do with the t-test not being very powerful. That's why we, we say that uh, it, it does it, it estimating the denominator is not. We don't have enough data to estimate it well, so we add a lot of variability that way. So that's what we're we're, we're going to talk about. Uh, ways in which we can improve that so that and, he, and here we can see the, the, the problem shown in another way we have the standard error estimate in the x-axis and the t-test in the y-axis and we can see that there's, there's some of these values that are, very, that are false positives that have high t-tests are, are genes that have very very small standard error estimates okay so the basic idea is to borrow strength, that's a phrase that statisticians use, from all the genes to estimate the standard deviation for a specific gene. All right, so generally speaking, we, what we do is we look at the distribution of the standard error estimates for all genes, that's what this is, and then we start wondering if some of these extreme values are, are that big or that small because of chance, and we're going to pull them in towards this, towards this mean, towards the center, and in, in a, process, a procedure that it statisticians call shrinking. So we're going to shrink, going to shrink the small values up towards the mean, and we're going to shrink the the large values down towards the mean, so that this this distribution gets gets shrunken in towards the center. And how do we? But how do we do that rigorously using? the mathematical procedure instead of just doing it ad hoc. So for that, we're going to use uh, empirical Bayes. That's what Lima is based on. So remember, we're going to be doing empirical Bayes on the standard errors, not the mean, not the mean values, but the standard errors. Now to, to explain the general idea, I am going to use a model for the means, and I'm going to explain empirical Bayes in a very general way. And in fact, I'm going to use an example has nothing to do with high, with genomes or biology, and it's uh, baseball. So, what we're going to do is we're going to explain why sports announcers are actually know about uh, empirical base, and they don't get excited when a new player is performing incredibly well at the beginning of a season. So very briefly, what I'm going to use batting averages, which is one measure of success in in baseball, which is the uh, it, it basically counts the percent. It measures the percent of time that a batter is successful. That's a very simplistic way of of explaining it. And being successful 30 percent of the time, which in baseball we call it batting 300. We use 300 because it's 300 divided by a thousand that's the way that it's described so batting 300 is very is very good now batting 400 so f being successful for 40 percent of the time is amazing and that has not happened since a long time ago 40 50 years ago when a player called Ted Williams did it uh, so but every season, or almost every season, at the very beginning of the season, when about two weeks have gone by, there will be one player maybe that that is in fact batting 400. Sometimes it's a new player, and nobody really even talks about it. Nobody gets excited about it. If but but if you are going to just predict, if you're a statistician and you want to predict their batting average at the end of the season, you have no choice. If you're you know use standard what are called quote unquote frequentist methods to predict that that batter is going to actually continue that that pattern and they're going to bat four, 400 and they're going to act, do this for the first time in, in decades. So the announcers don't, and that would be a big deal, that would be celebrated and it'd be, make the newspapers, maybe, maybe front page of some newspapers. 
but uh, nobody gets excited. And that's because they are in the back of their minds. They're 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 thinking in this Bayesian way. So what does that mean? All right. So the here's I want to explain the 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 mathematical formulation using batting averages again as as a example. So we have y is what we have observed. So two weeks have gone by, and we have certain number of of uh, of uh, plate appearances and the, the the batter is batting 400 so that's the outcome that we see 40 percent of the time they've been successful and we are we're saying that's so what we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna model some of the the variance the chance that that is involved in batting so sometimes you hit the ball really hard very well but you're very unlucky and it goes straight to some fielder and they, the fielder catches it. So that would be an error that's negative. You had bad luck. Sometimes the opposite happens. You you hit the ball very softly uh, and, and it just happens to fall right where nobody's standing. And that would be a positive error. You got lucky. So that variability is going to be uh, represented by this called the sampling distribution. And what it's saying is, Assuming that your true batting average, the, the, uh, the batting average that, that, is, that is your natural batting average that you were born with is theta, then there is some variability around that truth because of this, var this variance having to do with, with being lucky or not. Now, now what, what's new now in this empirical Bayes approach is that we're also going to add some variability uh, to to the true the inherit batting average. So now we're going to add a distribution to that. So this distribution is the is not has not is not related to you as an individual. It's related to all the players. So when the players born, there's there's some random assignment of their true batting average, and that's that's what this variability explains. So we have. Um, you know, some some people get high thetas, others get low thetas, and then once you have that, you st you're stuck with that. And when you go and play, you given that you have that theta, then we observe your batting average, and depending on how lucky or not lucky you were. Now, in 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 the statistical lingo, we call G the prior and F the sampling distribution. And now we can use the the rules of probability to get a better estimate of theta which is what we really want to know we really want to know your true batting average not what we've seen that could be due to luck but using both information the information of what we've seen and the information that we have about what the population of batters are like so uh, that's going to change things and that is what but baseball announcers ha are are doing without maybe without realizing they're they're doing it they're not thinking of these formulas but they're doing it in a ad hoc, in a uh, intuitive way they're saying I've I've been watching baseball for years and I know what G is so when I see a Y that's 400 I know I have a feeling that the real theta is not 400 because I have seen a lot of players and 400s are very very rare this G has uh, a very it's very unlikely that a, a theta will be a 400 uh, following this distribution so so we can we can compute I'm not going to go over the, the the calculus part of this but we can actually compute the distribution of theta given what we observe right so now theta the, the, the parameter is a random variable and we can observe we can we can estimate its its distribution given the data that we've seen so with the simplest example, which actually could be used in baseball, because uh, these batting averages are roughly normally distributed, uh, we can we can demonstrate this approach for the normal no, mo models using normal distribution, and, and things look very nice and and it actually make intuitive sense. So what we're saying here is that the the, the distribution of batting averages of true batting averages across the population of hitters is normal with mean mu and, and and variance tau squared. So mu is the typical batter. That's what their the typical batter is going to have like a mu of about 280, I think, is, a, is the average average. And then the variance is maybe 20. The standard deviation is about 20, I would say. So things vary between like 
40 and 320 or something like that uh, roughly so the tau, tau is about 20 but then we we have the, the sampling distribution which has to do with how so, so theta is the real the, what we want to know the real batting average of this person and sigma square is is the variance having to do with how lucky you've been and the more at bats you have the more data we observe this sigma is going to get smaller right the more we observe data then the, the the less luck is involved that's just like you can say that's like the central limit theorem of the law of large numbers more more precisely so now when we when we have that now what we can do is we can estimate for example the um, expected value what do we expect theta to be given that we've seen y so given that we've seen 400 we can estimate we can estimate the real um, batting average with this formula and you notice it's a combination it's a weighted average so b is a number between 0 and 1 between the observed batting average and the population batting average so and and then the b if you come down here and look at what it is it's a ratio of the variance it's a proportion of the variance that's, that is explained by luck of, of the, the sampling distribution so let's examine when is this beta big this beta is big when the the, the 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 sampling distribution variance is error so when there's very few at bats like at the beginning of the season this sigma is big because we haven't seen many at bats there's a lot of sampling error and when that's big then the, our estimates is basically mu what we're saying is we haven't seen enough data so we have to guess what this young new player is going to bat at the end of the season we're not going to guess 400 which is what he's been batting up to now we're actually going to guess 280 we're going to actually guess the population average and most of the time that that if you you know you should try this experiment you'll see you'll, you'll do pretty well if you follow this this approach much better than if you just go with y then what happens if if the opposite is true if we've seen if we've seen many many at bats enough to think that sampling error is now small say we've seen 300 at bats and this person is still batting 400 now the formula changes and b becomes closer to zero so now we're going to actually trust the data we see and not necessarily shrink back to mu so that is the base that's empirical base uh, explained in in 10 minutes and and the and the the reason this is empirical based and not straight Bayesian statistics is because we use the observed data to get a prior. In straight Bayesian statistics, this, the prior is not data driven. It's 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 um it's decided upon based on what expert knowledge is on what our or what our prior beliefs are. Okay, so now uh, with sorry with um. The getting back to gene expression now it's going to get a little more complicated because we are what is the analogous to to batting average here? It's not the differential expression measurement. It's re, it's the it's, it's the observed variance for the gene. Okay, so we're we're shrinking the variance, not the not the differences. So what we're saying here is if we see a gene with very very small variance from from the sample right so we have three observations and those three observations are very close to each other so the sample variance is tiny then we we then look at the variance of all the genes and see that tiny variances like that are very rare we're going to shrink that back to the towards the middle why because we think that very small variances are rare based on the distribution of all the observed sample variances so we shrink it back and actually if you assume a, a prior on for the variance that's an inverse chi-squared that why do we do that we do that because the math is convenient uh, we get a nice little formula that tells us how to shrink the variance so here is the here's the observed variance I'm sorry that's not the observed variance uh, here's the observed variance here is the 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 middle basically the the variance that we shrink towards. This is the population of all genes variance, and then these g these d's are the weights that have to do with first how many samples we have and second how tight 
is the distribution of, of, of the, of the uh, variances coming from the prior. So you can see it's very similar to the previous formula. It's a weighted average where if we, and what ends up happening is that the, if we have a small sample, then this guy gets more weight. So we shrink a lot, and when, as we have more and more samples, then, then this guy starts getting more weight. So we, we, stay, we stick with the original observed standard deviation. So once we, est we have this moderated or shrunken variance estimate, then we can for form what is referred to as a moderated t-statistic that basically uses that standard deviation instead of the original. And that is the statistic that Lima produces, and it gives us a much, much improved um, result. Notice now, compared to before, if we, if we just order by p-value, um, we get in the top 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, we only get two mistakes. And that is much better than what we had before. Okay, so that is, um, that's the empirical Bayes approach used by Lima that's become very popular. And, and the similar approaches are now being applied to RNA-seq, for example. Uh, now, the last, I just want to mention one last, very briefly, one last um, problem, and it's the, and it has to do with obtaining p-values when the null distribution is not really known. So in all these p-value calculations we, we've talked about right now, we make an assumption, sometimes based on asymptotic theory, sometimes based on other assumptions that aren't always true. So if the null hypothesis distribution is wrong, our p-values are going to be wrong. And to 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 if we if we're very concerned about that, that there is something we can do, and it's to use permutations. So uh, the this is just a five-minute description of what a permutation is, and how you do it. It's quite simple and intuitive, and it's easy to do in, in programs like R. So the uh, the general idea is that we we, we have samples uh, from K, from population one, population two. And what we're going to do is we're going to create all the statistics that we used, but we're going to force the null to be true by sampling, by reshuffling the samples. So basically, we reshuffle the samples, and we then we recalculate the statistics. So now um, what we do is we can we can take for example for each gene we can we can we can form a, a distribution of what the statistic looks like for that gene or we can combine all the genes that we think they're they're all going to have the same distribution but what we're going to what we have is we we by doing this permutation over and over and over again we're going to get the statistic that we're that we use to say rank genes we're going to get the distribution of that statistic for the null case because we have permuted the samples and then to compute a p-value, we, we basically count the number of times that the that the permutation created statistics are bigger than the one that we originally observed. Okay, and that's um, that's that's it. That's that's how permutation tests work. Very very simple. Um, okay, so the last thing I want to talk about, but we're actually going to do it in another lecture is the multiple comparison problem I wanted to mention here because it is a very important part of advanced differential expression lecture but it's going to be included we're going to have a separate lecture just for that